once again, it's your pal, the old salt, here with the last and probably most obscure of our Weiss Brother comedy series, Izzy and Lizzie. Now, hmm, little warning, we're going to have some hopefully gentle ethnic humor coming up here. This is one of the Irish-Jewish type comedies that were very popular in the 1920s. And, uh, but because they were sort of family comedies, usually they, they were a bit gentler in their stereotyping. Okay, this is about as bad as it gets right here. <laughs> All right, we're doing the hand gestures. Fair enough. It's also a nice little radio gag there at the beginning, considering that radio was in the late 20s now becoming a big part of the American conscience. And obviously, we had our Denise Austins on the radio here, too, giving you your morning calisthenics. And, uh, yeah, th like I said, th these Irish-Jewish comedies were very popular <laughs> in the 20s, basically thanks to the popularity of a Broadway play called Amy's Irish Rose, which we'll get into a bit later. Here's yes, Tim Murphy, played by Billy Gilbert, not uh, the Billy Gilbert that a lot of you uh, know, who's uh, Billy Sneezer Gilbert, the one who you see in a lot of, like, Laurel and Hardy comedies, and played, uh, I think, Sneezer in uh, Snow White and Some Dwarves did the voice. This is Billy Gilbert, who worked uh, at Senate, and we'll talk about him in a minute. Here's Best True, uh, the ingenue, not a spectacular career, but... Uh, Apart from this, really, she doesn't have a, a few B-Westerns, uh, a few other comedy roles. Probably her biggest film also came out this year, Sailor's Wives, first national picture starring Mary Astor, where she played a somewhat of a loose woman. Born in Anaconda, Montana in 1899. Died in New York July of 1947, sadly. Not a long life there. Here's Bud Duncan, who uh, certainly the most well-known name in this film, Bud Duncan was a comic whose career goes way back to teens. He started working at Universal around 1912. He'd been working, of course, in vaudeville before that. His uh, short stature guaranteed that uh, he played a lot of, like, comic book characters. <laughs> in fact, one of, one of his uh, early roles was half of an early live-action version of Mutt and Jeff at Universal. He's probably most famous for being half of the comedy team of Ham and Bud with Lloyd Hamilton. Very, very popular Calum comedy series in which they starred in hundreds of shorts between 1914 and 1917. Ham and Bud were recently called the Burke and Hare of silent comedy by one film historian. They were an extremely not nice pair <laughs> It, instead of showing the, the friendship that like Laurel and Hardy show, these guys would sell each other for medical experiments. Uh, they do that in a short called Midnight at the Old Middle, 1916. In another short called The Star Boarders, they do get together to gas their fellow boarding house residents into unconsciousness so they can steal all the furniture and sell it to the junk man. So they were a rather disagreeable team, but audiences loved them. And they kept... Calum Film Company <laughs> in business, pretty much. Uh, that, them and the Hazards of Helen, very popular serial that Calum produced in the teens. But uh, Ham and Bud continued until Calum went under, uh, along with uh, most of the Patents Trust producers, which Calum was one in 1917. Apparently, the, uh, the love and warmth you've you, you know, that emanates from Bud Duncan and Lloyd Hamilton on the screen uh, <laughs> were pretty much felt that way in real life. They hated each other, apparently. Um, Hamilton basically tried to live down him and Bud completely distanced himself from it and uh, changed his character completely uh, in, in his pictures and became a, a major comedy star in the 1920s. Now, Duncan, after Ham and Bud, uh, didn't have quite a successful career, but he did keep busy. He worked in a number of independent comedy series. He worked in the Clover comedies for the National Film Corporation, the Aladdin comedies, Bud and his buddy comedies for real crap, the only twins which were shot in 
Denver, Colorado, of all places. Bud, again, stayed busy. He made a series of one-reelers for William Pizer, who was a colleague of the Weiss Brothers. Uh, even the Weiss Brothers thought William Pizer was cheap, but uh, Bud made comedies for William Pizer, teaming with Marvin Loback, almost another sort of Ham and Bud type combination. But, uh, like I said, Duncan didn't work for the Weiss Brothers. He worked in a number of their series. You see him in uh, the Hairbreath Harry, Rudolph's Revenge, playing, I think, the hotel manager, and Belinda's dad. And, again, just was always busy. He worked in vaudeville when he wasn't making pictures. In 1929, after he left the Weiss's employ, he played yet another comic strip character. He and Senate comedian Thelma Hill uh, went to work for producer Larry Darmore in a series based on the comic strip Toots and Casper. Late silent comedies came out in most of 1929. Oh, here we are back at Santa Fe Station again. Seems to be another popular Weiss location. But uh, Bud's career, Hollywood-wise, slowed down in the 30s. He was still playing mid parts. You can see him from time to time, but he's doing a lot more vaudeville and radio work, strangely enough. In fact, radio buffs will, uh, I'm sure, know or be glad to know that Bud Duncan was the voice of Cinnamon Bear in the 1937 syndicated children's radio series, which has been a radio perennial, I think, ever since. He actually starred in two more talkies being you know being that comic strip character size worked his favor one more time 1941 monogram hired bud to play private snuffy smith in two comedy features uh, i think both of them or at least one of them co-starring edgar kennedy but uh private snuffy smith and hillbilly blitzkrieg which uh, you get to hear bud's voice under a lot of makeup <laughs> made up to look like snuffy smith but he lived until 1960, so he was in his 80s, passed away at a ripe old age. So outliving his partner Lloyd Hamilton, who even though was a bigger star, was had a career plagued with uh, alcoholism, personal problems, and Lloyd Hamilton passed away in 1935. So who's to say who had the better life? Now Billy Gilbert is an interesting fellow. Again, like I said, he worked a lot at Senate, Born in 1891, was uh, working in show business from the age of five, working in vaudeville, uh, athletic stunts, he worked as a jockey, he worked as a clown, he was working at Coney Island at uh, Steeplechase as early as 1909, and in fact, Billy Gilbert set a high dive record of 125 feet off Coney Island's Dreamland Pier in the time that he was in the employ <laughs> there, which I think uh, is actually a record that uh, was never topped. So he went to work for Senate in 1913, went to work for Keystone. He and his wife, Norma Felicia, both worked at Keystone through the teens. Billy Gilbert adapted all sorts of makeups, played a lot of old men, played Keystone Cops, did all sorts of stunts. Again, was a, all, always busy through a big chunk of the teens at Keystone. Though he did Moonlight. He worked at Roland for a while uh, at Hal Roach's studio, appearing in I don't know, half a dozen or so of the Harold Lloyd Glasses comedies. And he went to work uh, for the Fox Sunshine comedies. He even had his own one real series. He was working in the Aladdin comedies for Real Craft, ironically, at the same time Bud Duncan was. Bud Duncan was also starring in the Aladdin comedies. He appeared in features, the Fox feature Dynamite Alley in 1921. Again, bounced back and forth uh, between Senate and Fox a lot in the 20s, but it, again, at the 20s was a mainstay. You see him in tons of Senate comedies. But he was also working for Joe Rock. He was in Larry Seaman's last comedy, Simple Sap with Jimmy Aubrey. Basically, when talkies came in, he retired, at least from acting in films, continued to work as a prop man at Senate, and then continued to work as a prop man at Republic, which I think was actually in those the Senate studios at Studio City, and worked you know, busily there until his death in 1961. So, again, not, not the Billy Gilbert that we know and love, but... Uh, Still a, a very busy comedian. Oh, now we're back on Larchmont. 
in the other popular Weiss location. Now, as, as I said, Izzy and Lizzie's were basically part of a genre in the 20s, the, the Irish-Jewish family comedies, which again became a trend because of the popularity of a play called A.B.'s Irish Rose. Now, A.B.'s Irish Rose was written by Ann Nichols, who uh, it was actually, her, I think, her first play, and I'm not sure it wasn't her only play. You didn't need another one uh, when you're that successful. Now, it, she sold it to Oliver Morosco, who was one of the, the big Broadway producers, but Morosco was staging it in California, San Francisco, Los Angeles, uh, you know, and, and the West Coast. He didn't want to bring it to Broadway. It's about 1921-22. And Ann Nichols finally said, you know, hey, we're making money. Take it to Broadway. He didn't want to do it because he was afraid these sophisticated New York audiences and critics would, you know, think it was a corny piece of hokum. But it opened on Broadway, May 23rd, 1922, ran for five years, closed October 1st, 1927, after 2,327 performances. I think it's still the longest-running non-musical Broadway play, and then continued in numerous touring companies. (laughs) On into today, you can still... Uh, fine productions of Abe's Irish Rose being done in community theater and other places. But the popularity of the play, and especially the fact that you, you, they weren't able to make, oh, a little bit of silent comedy cheesecake here. Always nice to have a bathing beauty to look at, apart from all these mangy old comedians. But as I was saying, the popularity of Abe's Irish Rose you know, forced Hollywood to do what Hollywood always does, impersonate and imitate. Uh, Most uh, obviously with Universal, who initiated the Coens and Kellys series, starring George Sidney and Charlie Murray. Uh, Coens and Kellys was a big hit for Universal in 1926. Actually, Universal made a number of uh, Jewish-Irish pictures. Another big success from 1925 was His People with Rudolf Schildekraut, which was a little more dramatic take on it. But nevertheless, it was, it was still the same situation. They did another one called We Americans several years later. The How Roach Max Davidson series, again, completely uh, a ripoff of Baby's Irish Rose, but a very well done one and, you know, a wonderful comedy series. And Max Davidson had appeared in various productions of Baby's Irish Rose. Uh, and so, you know, it was, it was a perfect person to put the part. So, Again, uh, the Izzy and Lizzie series, a, a very low-rent version of, the, <laughs> of the, the, the trend. But still, the Weiss brothers were not one to, uh, to, let, you know, to let a trend go by. Now, we're doing you know, a comedy. This is you know, a movie set comedy. Usually when, when a film company did a, oh, let's shoot a comedy on a film set, they were saving money. But ironically, you know, the Weiss brothers didn't own a studio. So they still had (laughs) to rent a studio, shoot a comedy, set in a studio. So I don't don't know that they were actually saving anything. Now, there's a couple, there's some evidence here. We're still not quite sure where the Weiss brothers shot. I think they shot a number of places, including studio, which I think I'm still not convinced that there isn't, there wasn't a small studio on Larchmont Avenue, which is why I used to see a lot of Larchmont Avenue when they were shooting. But there's some evidence here that where we're shooting here is actually the Stern Brothers studio. Stern Brothers, we'd mentioned, had done some productions with the Weiss Brothers. I think they were definitely tied in. A lot of the comedians working in Stern Brother comedies are appearing in these. And we'll, we'll go into a little more detail on that in a minute. But uh, it is nice. You are getting a, a few little bits about silent comedy, apart from the, the, the dummies and the, the thing about the breakaway vases and the and the real vases, which of course the breakaway ones were made out of candy glass. There you're seeing here one of the wind machines that, uh, you know, in the background there that uh, they would use when they wanted a good breeze or a hurricane or that sort of thing. Turn on several of those. Those look like airplane motors. And they were actually, actually getting an outdoor location scene here, which almost looks like a western set. Maybe, uh, Maybe the Weisses uh, ran out and shot this on location of one of their action pictures, which uh, they were producing. 
and releasing at the time. Ah, it looks almost like, yeah, it is, it is rural. That's, that is, although then again, it was a lot easier to find a rural area in Los Angeles than before everything was built up. Yeah. No, can't, I don't know who the, the cowboy stars are. But, uh, that's true is not bad here. She's, uh, she's engaging. But, uh, her career, he said, didn't seem to amount, amount to much. It's interesting, the one thing you don't see ever, and, you know, I've been studying silent film comedy for 40 years, I've never seen a picture of the cranes that they use to hang the wire, you know, comedians on wires or props on wires. Uh, that seemed to have been a big secret. Now, that's a Bell and Howell camera the cameraman's using, which uh, probably was actually one of the ones being used to, to shoot the comedy, except in, in that shot. Now, uh, Bell and Howells were pretty much the mainstay camera of the early 20s before the Mitchell camera came in, but that's a uh, fine example of that that may, may actually be one of the cameramen hiding out uh, behind there so we don't see him. Now, here's a little bit of evidence Makes me wonder if this isn't being shot on the Stern Brothers set. Watch the director's megaphone. And notice what's written on it are the word, or is the word, Snookums. Now, Snookums was the name of a character in the Stern Brothers comedy series The Newlyweds and Their Baby. It was the baby played by Sonny McKean, Snookums. And that's the only reason I can figure that there would be a uh, megaphone that says Snookums in the Weiss Brother set there, but oh, we see pies, the other standard comedy crop. And another pie fight begins here, which is actually a pretty good way to wrap up this short and, frankly, wrap up our whole little trip through the wonderful world of Weisserama. Hope you enjoyed them and uh, said they weren't, <laughs> they weren't chaplains. You weren't going to see great classics of comedy here, but what, what you did get to see were a lot of talented workaday comedians you know, do, doing what they did and, and, and doing their best. And I hope you had a laugh or two. But it's, I, you know, I always admire laugh getting is a a tough business, especially in those days. Especially if they're working for the Weiss brothers, because they definitely weren't getting rich. And uh, however good humor can be for an audience, getting those laughs I think was pretty tough on some of the practitioners. So. Here's to them, wherever they were working. And uh, who would think that 80 plus years later, <laughs> you know, we'd still be looking at them here in, in this kind of quality. So, an interesting trip. We hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't, go over to the extras and take a look at Jungle Land and you'll see just how good these ones really are. We actually made Phil Carley play for that thing with the chips. That's In any event, this is Richard Rose. I have to catch my train, so until we meet again, we hope you enjoyed the wonderful world of Weiss Arena. Goodbye now.